Hey y'all, welcome back. It's Mr. Boyden, your personal math teacher, um, and I'm back again to start chapter four, where we're gonna be talking about sampling methods, surveys, experimentation, and ethics. So here's lesson one on sampling and surveys. As I'm recording this video, um, we are about a week and a half out from the presidential election in 2020. Um, and the two front runners right now are Joe Biden and Donald Trump. And so I'm including this graphic in the video because it um, is a really relevant topic at the time that I'm recording this. And then um, this is one of the applications that I think is really important for people to know and understand um, about sampling and surveys is we have all these polls that lead up to the election. And so we have the results of one of those polls here on the screen. So those are things we're going to be learning as we go forward in this class. We're going to be learning basically how, how do they do those polls? How do they, like, what do these numbers mean? You know, right now it says 51% for Joe Biden, 43% for Donald Trump. Um, does that mean that Joe Biden's going to win? I don't know. We're going to talk about that down here on the right. Kind of hard to see, but I'm highlighting it now. It says the margin of error is um, plus or minus three points. So we're going to be learning, you know, what's up with the margin of error? How is it calculated? What does it really mean in this context? And what does that tell us about how likely either of these people are uh, to win the election? So that's kind of a, a lead in to like what we're heading toward understanding in this class. Um, so let's get started with some specifics. In this unit, we're really going to be looking at studies. And they don't use that word very often, but that's basically what they are. Okay, And so we have two kinds we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about both um, surveys, which is a sampling method. And we're going to be talking about experiments as well. Both of these fall under the umbrella of studies. And so I'm saying that at the outset, because sometimes people are like, wait, is that a survey or a study? Well, all surveys are studies. So um, just know that if you see that word study thrown away around, it just means that we're doing some sort of research to answer a question. Surveys are one way to try to answer that question. And experiments are another. We'll do experiments in the next video. Today's all about surveys. So let's get started. A lot of ideas here that we need to talk about. Okay, the first thing we're gonna talk about is a sample. And so in reference to like when you do polling, the sample is the people or things that create the data. Okay, the people or things that create the data. So uh, if I go out into a forest and I want to know how healthy the trees are, um, I can't check out every single tree in the forest, but I could go pick some of the trees and I could see how healthy they are with whatever method that I use. And so the trees that I select, those are the ones of the sample. In that example, the population would be all of the trees in the forest. So it is a group that the sample is a subset of. So I'm going to say sample is a subset of this, meaning that um, everything in the sample is in the population. And specifically, it's the group that we want to infer something about, or the group that we want to answer a question about. Question about. Okay, so like for example, we had that election example just a minute ago. Let me go back up to that. The results of this study were that 51% of the American people will vote for Joe Biden and 43% of the people, or I should say registered voters, 43% of the registered voters will vote for Donald Trump. But we didn't ask everybody. They asked a handful of people. And it doesn't say on this graphic how many people they asked, but they didn't ask everybody. They didn't ask me. And I'm a registered voter. So I'm part of the population. The population in this example is all registered voters, or maybe it's likely voters is sometimes the way they phrase it, the people who are going to vote. And so this is a prediction based on a survey or based on a sample of a smaller number of people, how all of the people are going to vote. Okay. Now, what is a census? Okay, in fact, we just did it the year, as I'm recording this is 2020, we just did a census. Census is when your sample and your population are the exact same group. Okay, now I'm not gonna write it that way, but that's like when you collect data from everybody or everything. So, so from every uh, everybody or thing. And so that would be, for example, if I wanted to know how old the trees are in the forest, the only way to do that is to go take a core sample of every single tree if I wanted to do a census. 
um, because it's not necessarily good for all trees. If I take a core sample from every single one of them, I might go do a sample of 5% of the trees in the forest. And then I would approximate the age of the trees on average in the forest. Okay. So um, why do we do samples rather than a census? A census yields a way better result. So like, for example, in that election poll, if they ask everyone in the population, then they really will have a very, very good idea of how people will vote. And there wouldn't be a margin of error. When you do a sample, you are making an estimate or a prediction. And so it's not as accurate. So why do we do samples? Well, the reason we need to do samples is because it's very labor time and money intensive to do a census. Doing a census costs a lot of money. Sometimes it even is damaging. Like for example, sometimes when they do like sampling in biology, sometimes the way you do a sample is you have to unfortunately kill the animal and open it up to see what's going on inside. Well, if you did that with every animal in the species, that would be called an extinction event. You can't do that. So what we do is just little sampling instead for all of those reasons. Okay, even, even with the trees in the forest example, to go take core samples of every single tree would be very expensive. That's the same reason why with election polling, they don't go and find every person in the country and ask them because it's prohibitively expensive. You can't do that. So guys, really like a lot of things in life, it does come down to money or in sometimes harming um, a group or a resource. Okay. So I'm wondering if you can think of any examples of sample surveys that you know of. How about Yelp? Like where you go in and give a review after you eat at a place or you have an experience at some establishment. Technically, yeah, we're going to learn um, that's called a, a voluntary response sample here in just a minute. Um, Amazon reviews, yeah, we have to be careful because not everybody responds. There's some non-response bias, which we'll talk about later in the lesson today as well. Netflix ratings, yeah, we're, we're putting in our data where, and not everybody's doing it, so it's not a census. That, those are all examples of sample surveys, actually, um, of varying validity for different reasons. Okay, so on to number two. A sample survey is just a study that collects data, okay? And we choose it from a sample, not from the census. That sample is said to be representative of a population. And we already talked about why not ask everybody. It's all, it's not always money, but a lot of times it's money, time, um, amount of effort, or potentially harm to a resource. Convenience sampling is the thing that we do most commonly or that we see a lot. It's when you select individuals from a population who are easy to reach, it would be like if I went up to lunch at school and um, I just asked the people who were standing around me in line as we were waiting to get our pizza. It's very easy for me to do that. It's low effort. I can collect data quickly. The issue is, is it is probably not representative of the population. Like if I want to know how many people are going to the football game and I only ask people in the lunch line, well, I haven't asked anybody who brought their lunch from home. I haven't asked anybody who doesn't eat lunch. I haven't asked anybody who's late to lunch. And so I don't have um, lots of different people in my sample. And therefore my population that I can estimate is only people who eat lunch at the same time as me who are standing next to me. Well, not very useful. Another really common method that we see is the voluntary response sample. And that's another one that's pretty easy. That's like any survey that's posted online or if you've ever gone to a website and says, hey, we wanna ask you three questions about whatever and you have the option to respond or to not. That's why it's called voluntary response. You choose if you want to, and if you want to, you can, and if you don't want to, you don't need to. Okay, and that they have some invitations. Maybe the invitation was you went to the website. These can be super misleading. For example, if you, um, if you go to some website that is, uh, let's say that you went to the People for Ethical Treatment of Animals website, and then you took a, a survey on if you think animal testing in medicine is acceptable or not for lab rats, there's likely to be a, a biased result. And so then if, if PETA wanted to make a claim about um, the people who visit their website, they could, but oftentimes people will use or organizations will use voluntary response samples and they'll claim that the population is all people or all Americans or all adults when really the people in their sample fall into a very specific category. So that's a way to be very misleading with statistics that we want to make sure we inoculate ourselves against. And so all of these methods we've talked about so far are considered to be sort of subpar. Okay, they're, they're not excellent ways of finding truth. Because remember, the whole point of this is we're taking data from a sample to try to find out the truth in something or some metric about the population. Sample surveys, Convenience sampling and voluntary response samples. If you have to do them, they're fine, but they're not the best. What we're gonna look at now in number five is four methods that are considered to be quite good. And these are really approved ways of sampling. All of them involve randomization. 
okay? A little bit of randomization process. Right here, we have two ways that in this class we're gonna talk about for um, how to do randomization. These are the two common ways, either a random number table or a random number generator. And we'll do examples of both of those in just a minute. Okay, the reason we randomize is to make sure that we get a, or to do our best to get a representative sample. So the goal of randomization is to get a representative sample And that means that we want the types of people in our sample to represent the group that we're making a claim about. So if you imagine if we, like I'm living in Tacoma right now where we live, it's a very diverse population. Um, lots of different ethnicities, religions, um, socioeconomic statuses. If I were gonna do a sample in Tacoma, I would wanna make sure that people from all of those groups, if my population is people of Tacoma, that is, if, my, if I want that to be the case, I need to, do a method like this to make sure that I have people from all those different backgrounds and situations that are represented in my data when I'm looking for the truth. In case again, that's a way if, if you were if you were trying to make a point that wasn't the truth, if you were trying to uh, do something sort of nefarious or be misleading, you would just make sure that you wouldn't use randomization and you wouldn't have um, that equal representation in your in your study. And if you look at a study, that's a huge red flag. If they don't randomize, red flag, big time. Doesn't mean it's definitely wrong, but it's a big red flag. Let's talk about simple random samples. This is a really common one, okay? What this is, is we choose how many data points we want out of our population. We figure out what our population is, and then we use a random method of selecting where we're gonna take the data from, the participants, or sometimes called the subjects, okay? So like, for example, with the trees, if there are 10,000 trees and I want um, 100 data points because I don't want to, you know, go look at every single tree. That's a lot of trees to look at. Then I would randomly select uh, 100 numbers from 1 to 10,000 and those would be the trees that I would go check out. Let's go to the right for a second, go talk about random number tables and we'll talk about random number generators. Okay, so uh, let's let's do an example here. Um, let's say that we have uh, 100 people in a room, and for some reason they're they're numbered, and we want to ask 10 people some question about, uh, do you like the music at the party tonight? Okay, so we want to ask 10 people about the music. The easiest thing to do would be to find the 10 closest people or the 10 people that we know and ask them, but that would be a convenience sample. We could uh, put a sign at the door that says, please write down what you thought about this, but that would be voluntary response. If we wanted to do a simple random sample, what we would do is we would take a list of the people's names. So everyone gets a number, and I don't mean you like physically hand it, but I mean like you assign on paper uh, a number to everyone. So everyone gets a number from zero, zero to 99. Okay, that's super weird. This is kind of a relic of the past. Um, on a calculator, you can go one to 100 if you want. But in this, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go zero, zero to 99 because of the way that a random number table works. I'm gonna show you how to use a random number table now to pick out these values. So what we do on the random number table is we select a row and I'm just gonna pick one. So I'm gonna look and uh, this is my row. Okay, and now I need to pick 10 people from zero to 99. So here's how I do it. I look at the first two digits, so 41. So then I would look at my list of people and we ask that person the question. 85 is the next person, 99 is the next person. And hey guys, look at this, 41, there's a repeat. Now it would make no sense to ask the same person again. So what we do is we just cross that one out. We're not gonna ask the same person the question twice and we keep going, so 98, 37, 18, 26, how many numbers do I have so far? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So the eighth number is 13, the ninth number is 45, and the 10th person is person number 88. And then we would go ask those people our survey question about the music or our questions about the music. And then we would have random, or randomly chosen people. Okay, so that's how we do it on a random number table. Here's how we do it on the calculator.
In the calculator, we need to be on a calculate screen. It could be in a document and you could add calculator. Either way works. So I'm going to click here. Then we go to menu. It's in the probability menu. We're doing random numbers. So we're going to go to random and then specifically we need to do random integer. Now I'd like you to get in the habit before you do, do that of picking a random seed. I'm not going to go into the reasons why in this video, just suffice it to say that if you don't, then everybody will get the same random numbers and there's nothing random about everybody getting the same thing. So you go in here, you pick your favorite number, um, 784, I'm just picking a number and hit enter and it'll say, yeah, we got you. We read you loud and clear. And then we'll go back into the same menu, probability, random, integer. And so I'm going to do this the same way we did before. We're going to ask that it gives us numbers from zero to 99. And so I'm just going to demonstrate this one first. This is going to pop out a random number from zero to 99. And there you can see that number is 51. And that's perfectly fine if um, I only need one number or if I'm happy just hitting enter a bunch of times and getting new random numbers and it's happy to spit them out. I'm just hitting enter over and over and over. Um, but you actually can tell your calculator to spit out 10 numbers at once. So what you do is you just add a third number. So the first number, the first two numbers are telling the calculator the range that you want saying, I want numbers from zero to 99. If you add another number, you're now t also telling the calculator how many numbers you want it to spit out. So check it out. There's 10 random numbers. Now let's make sure there's no repeats. So I'm going to look through there real quick. I don't notice a repeat. Hopefully I didn't miss it if there was. If there was a repeat, I would just simply hit the enter key again and I would take the next number there. So like if there was a repeat, I'd have thrown out the repeat and I'd have added in this case 10 to the data set. And that's how we do it in the calculator. The next random sampling method we need to talk about is the stratified random sample. This um, is considered to be a little bit better than simple random sample. Simple random is good. Stratified is considered to be a little bit better. Okay, so we'll look at why. What this is, is you're going to first define strata. And strata are just groups of individuals. You're going to group them together by characteristics, which you think will be associated with what we're measuring. So um, if, if we were doing something about the election, we might uh, have groups with uh, political affiliation in the past if, or the party that they identify with. And we'd make sure that we had, um, we'd have independents and people who support the Green Party and Republicans and Democrats. We would want lots of different people in our survey. You know, like in the beginning with that election example, if you only ask people who are registered Democrats, the way they vote is probably not in line with how the whole country votes. So we'd want to make sure we had lots of um, different people represented, different groups of people represented. So the, the strata are just that. They're groups which you think will have a different characteristic. Okay. Um, another example, if I were going to be surveying trees along the side of a mountain, I might have the strata be, so if I have my mountain, let's actually draw a mountain out here. So if I have a mountain and I got trees on the side of it, I might have my strata be the different altitudes because I know that trees grow differently at different altitudes and maybe they live for different lengths at different altitudes and eventually there's a tree line and the trees top out. So those could be my strata in that example because I think that would matter. What this does is it prevents the rand because folks randomly you could potentially end up with clusters of your sample in one spot. Like it's possible that if I had a thousand trees, I mean, once in a while, the numbers one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten will pop out of the randomizer, and you could potentially end up sampling just all the trees at the bottom with randomization. Um, stratification makes that impossible. Okay, so it eliminates that weird possibility. Okay, so what you do once you once you choose what your strata are, then you just do simple random samples within each stratum. So then what we do is so like instead of picking numbers from one to a hundred, I would pick one number from one to 10, one number from, cause if there's 10 trees in each of these, one number from one to 10 and it would just so on and so on. Okay. So strengths are, um, really good representation. Typically you have very few issues with having it be represent representative. So I'm going to say that it's representative. A weakness, potentially it could be more work, I guess. Um, if you can pull it off, it's a really good way to go though. Another good way to go is cluster sampling. Cluster sampling is really easy to confuse with stratified. That was my experience both as a learner and it's been my experience as a teacher that sometimes we get these mixed in our head, but I've, um, I've put in caps the word that distinguishes them and that's the word all down here. Let's see what it means. So just like with stratified, we're going to select specific groups. Okay. But now 
if you select groups, then we're going to survey every member from the group. And we're going to see some examples of this later. Okay, so versus um, we would select a random sample in the previous one. So you're selecting a random sample within the strata or stratum. With a cluster, you're going to be sampling every member in that group. The final one, and this one is fine as well. Um, all four of these methods are considered good. Um, the last one is systematic random sampling. And so the way this one starts is by generating a random number. So pick a number, and I have an example here. So let's say we pick a number from 1 to 20, and let's say that the number is 17. From that number, we're going to, in this example at least, we're going to sample every 20th, let's say it's person. And so um, for us, let's say that it's people coming into the Seahawks game. And we ask them if the, we think the Seahawks are going to win or lose. And so we would ask the 17th person and the 37th person to walk through the door. And we would ask the 57th person. And so that's this every 20th person. And so this is a way of generating data. In this case, you get you you make sure that you get people who came to the game early, who came to the game late, who came to the game on time. All those people get asked from those different groups. Um, it's way quicker and easier than asking every single person. You don't end up with as much data, but it tends to be roughly representative. Um, and it's called systematic because randomization is picking it, and it's a pattern. So there's like a system that we're employing. Like this is there's like a rule that determines um, who we're going to pick to ask. Um, and so we're not, you know, choosing out of convenience or out of bias or something like that. Okay, so those are all the methods. We're now going to talk about um, bias and error and some features of these, and then we'll look at a, a handful of examples at the end. Let's get to bias and error. These are going to come up now. They're going to come up in a, a few units later, and we'll continue to build on them. We'll actually be calculating error in a later unit, and we're going to be seeing what that is. That's uh, error is that MOE that we saw, margin of error that we saw on that initial graphic at the top of the video. And sometimes people, I've heard people say stuff like, well, if they're doing polling, why do they have errors? Why don't they just eliminate their errors and get it right? That's not possible. Error does not mean uh, like the casual version of error, like, oh, I made an error when I you know, write a, wrote a five instead of a seven. It's not that type of error. What error is referencing is that when you ask only a sample or when you take only a sample of something, you're not getting all of the data of the population. And so your sample findings are not going to be exactly what the population would have been. That's all error says. Now that's said a different way down here. It says the natural variance between your sample response and the response that would have come from a census. So census meaning asking everyone in the population. Notice this word natural. It's a natural variance. It does not mean that you messed up. This is just how it works. Like if I ask five people what their favorite flavor of ice cream is, I'm not going to necessarily get the exact same answer as if I asked 500 people. Okay. That's all it's saying. Bias is something we have to look out for. Those guys so error. We'll talk about how to deal with that later, but bias is something we need to always be vigilant about. Bias is when we've chosen a method that is likely to over or underestimate what we're trying to measure. So if we're talking about like education reform and we only ask teachers, then there's going to be a bias toward what those teachers think. If we only ask students, they're going to have a bias one way or another. We all have biases. And that's why we need representative samples. So that's something that we really need to um, be aware of, any methods that would do that. And so we're going to see in some of these issues, some of these are examples of bias. So let's look at those now. Okay. So these are problems that we need to be aware of. The reason we talk about these is if you're designing a sample method, you'd want to think about these things as you designed your study. Okay. First issue is under coverage. It's when some members of a population are less likely to be chosen or cannot be chosen or cannot participate. So the example we have here is if you conduct a survey at the McDonald's drive through but that survey is not related to McDonald's. So if you, um, if you asked people at the McDonald's drive through um, what their favorite sports team is maybe, that's not going to be representative of the human population because not everybody eats at McDonald's. Like for example, some people are just Burger King people. Like that's just where they go. Some people don't eat fast food. Some people can't afford fast food. Some people only eat at Whole Foods. And all those people would be excluded um, from this data set. So it's, you end up with um, a situation where your data are not representative of your population. That's what under coverage does. Another one is non-response. Okay. And that's where there's individuals that you chose with your randomization method and they either cannot be contacted for some reason or if they refuse. 
This is a big problem now with sampling done by phone. You know, a long time ago, like 30 years ago, before caller ID, people would just answer their phone when it rang. But now, and, and they would often respond to a survey. But now, a lot of us, if we don't know the number that's calling, we won't answer it. And so then we get excluded from the opportunity because of that, because of our own choices that we don't get to participate. Now, I'll be honest with you. I don't answer my phone if I don't know the number. And as I, I, a lot of times I assume it's a scam and I say, well, they can leave a message or whatever. And that means that I don't get to participate in this type of survey, a phone survey. And I'm okay with that, but that, that just is a feature of this. Okay. Um, response bias. This is when there is some sort of systematic pattern of inaccurate answers to a survey question. So the, a classic example is um, if we ask people if they pick their nose. So like if I'm in class and I say, all right, I want everybody who picks their nose to raise their hand. Well, if everyone can see that you're going to raise your hand and you're going to be a nose picker and you're going to be outed, then even if you're a nose picker, you're probably not going to do that. So the reason that's a bias in this example, the result you get from asking this question so the result is probably going to be lower than the truth because we know people pick their nose. But if we ask this in the class, I mean, it would be unusual to have more than one or two people raise their hand. They go, oh crap, I'm the nose picker. Okay. So, but we know that there are people, a lot more than one people, one person in each room, I should say that, that does that. Okay. So that's something that we could know in advance when we ask the question. This is a reason why a lot of times, if you can try to give anonymity to participants, you can often get better responses. Um, and that could be very important. What about wording or setup bias? Wording or setup bias is when you have like these really strong trigger words in your, um, so I'm gonna write that down, that there, there could be trigger words that skew a question's response. Okay, so, um, for example, we have two here. Should the administration of Foss High School ban all sugary foods at school? The word ban is very polarizing. Like when you have a ban, like, oh, it's banned? We're banning this? Like book banning? Like, oh no. Okay, so if you say the word ban, people will oftentimes will be skewed or biased towards saying like, no, I don't want you to ban stuff. Don't, don't do a ban. Come on. Okay, so then what about B? Should the, uh, should the school ensure that students are served a healthy, nutritious food in the cafeteria? So there aren't as many strong words there. Okay. I saw one recently, it was actually this week. I saw one um, in a survey that we did at our school. And the question was, are you proud of your school? And um, as compared to a question that earlier in the survey that read, um, do you feel good about? And what I noticed is there were people that were comparing the two answers to these and, and saying, wow, they, people really are, don't feel good about the school compared to the first thing that was asked. But that's not a fair comparison. Proud is one of these trigger words. It takes a lot to you know, evoke pride from a person. There's a lot of things that we could feel good about, um, but we're not super proud of. Like, I'm feeling pretty good about this video and how it's going right now, but I don't know yet if I'm super proud of it. Like, oh, this was the best video. Like, I, I don't know. We'll see. That'll, that's actually kind of more for you to decide, isn't it? Okay, so we want to look out for those words, both in our own design and in the designs of others. To kind of try to stitch all these topics together, we're going to do one big example here at the end. And here it is. At our school, the staff students would like to know about how many students are planning to go to the musical so that they can decide how much the theater club should spend on costume design. They pick their five favorite teachers and they have those teachers give a written survey in their class during seminar time. So. In this example, what is the population and what is the sample? Okay, so the population is the group that you want to know about. They want to know about how many students. Now, they didn't specify, but it seems like they're saying students in the school. So the population is students at school. At our school. And what is the sample? The sample is where we got the data from. So it comes from the five favorite teachers and they gave a survey. So it would be the students in the five teachers classes. Now, as we go through these questions, you might find it to be a useful exercise to pause the video and try to answer these questions for yourself, or at the very least, just think about them. And then as I talk through them, see how your answers relate to mine. Now, y'all, this is not a straight up math class where like the answer is six and everybody needs to get it, right? 
there are some variances that are allowed in your answers to mine. So if you're thinking something a little bit different than me, that doesn't mean it's wrong, okay? It doesn't mean it's right, but don't just assume like, oh, Boyden said this, so therefore I'm wrong. Eh, not necessarily, okay? What kind of sampling method is this? Um, Y'all, this is straight up convenience, okay? Going to your favorite teachers is easy. It's convenient. All right, what are the potential issues with using this method? Well, one of the potential issues is that it's not representative. Okay, if you pick your five favorite teachers, I wonder, maybe all five of your favorite teachers are math teachers because you love math so much. And so you end up with these students who are in math teachers classes and that could skew it in some way. It could be that your five favorite teachers all have seniors in their class. And so you get a bunch of seniors who answer this survey and maybe because seniors are, they're more independent, they have you know a job, they can afford to go to the musical. Maybe they're more likely to go, that could introduce a bias. So those are, those are just a couple potential issues. Now, we're gonna talk through the other methods that we learned. How would a voluntary response sample work in this situation? There's lots of different ways to do this. My idea for it is a QR code posted in the school. So posted in the hall. And you could just have a question that says like, hey, are you planning to come to the musical? Which night are you planning to come? And then the student would scan that with their phone and they would respond to it. And that would be voluntary. Um, they, you may get a lot of data with that, you may not. It may be representative, it may not, I don't know. Uh, simple random sample. The way that would work is, and this would be kind of hard, we would need to get a hold of a list of every student in the school. And then we'd have to assign them a number, one through whatever, and then randomly select however many, maybe we want 20 data points. We would randomly select um, 20 data points and that would tell us the percentage of people that we think will come. Stratified. If we were gonna do stratified, what we might do, we would pick strata that we think determine the likelihood of going. One easy way to do this is have your strata be ninth graders, 10th graders, 11th graders, and 12th graders. And a reason I might choose this, like I said earlier, ninth graders are probably not as involved in school stuff. They may not have as many friends in the school. They may not know people who are in the musical who have lead roles, because often those go to upperclassmen, and they may not be independent, may not have a job to be able to afford to go. So they're less likely to go, possibly. And on the other end of the spectrum, seniors, for all the opposite reasons, are much more likely to go. So I would break up all the student lists into those groups, and then I would select maybe 10 from each group at random, using the random number generator. And guys, I'm just making up the number 10, okay? There's no there's no magic there. It's just, it's you get to choose how many data you want. It's based on the resources you have and the time you have to collect the data. Logistics of a cluster sample. And this is where I hope the difference between a stratified sample and a cluster sample will start to make sense. In a cluster sample, what we might do is say the clusters are each teacher's students. Each teacher's, oops, each teacher's students in that class period. And then what we might do is we would select, and this would be of course with randomization, right? So we would select one ninth grade teacher. And because it's a cluster, then every student would get a survey in that teacher's class. So select one ninth grade teacher, every student takes the survey. And then we would repeat the same thing for 10th grade. We would select one 10th grade teacher and rinse and repeat for 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. I'm not gonna make you sit here and watch my handwriting for that, but that's what it would be. So guys, you see that, that every student takes it. So that's the distinction between a cluster sample. With stratified, you're taking a simple random sample out of each stratum. But with a cluster, when you select a cluster and you randomly select the cluster, but once you have it picked, every item or every object or every subject in there is gonna be a part of the data then, okay? And then all things considered, you get to decide which uh, sample method is the most appropriate. And that's up to you, okay? Now, there are some wrong answers. Voluntary response is not the best way to do it. And convenience is not the best way to do it. But what you might think about is, and don't think about it academically, think about it in practice because it might seem like stratified sample is the best. But in the example I gave here, you would end up with 40 students to track down all over the school. And that wouldn't be easy. What would be really easy 
and still valid would be the cluster sample. So Mr. Boyden's pick on this, ding, 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 I'm going with the cluster sample. Why? Because what it involves is all we have to do once we've done this selection method is we only have to go to the seminar classes of those four teachers and then make sure every student has access to the survey. So four people could enact this method in about 10 minutes versus if you had to go track down the people from the other methods, it would take a very long time and it would be very hard. So y'all, that's the video for today. That's kind of uh, your crash course on all these sampling methods and features. We'll talk about experiments next time. Hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you then.